Thank you so much for coming today. <clears throat> if you had told me that I was going to be following Ping Kun Hu, I might not have talked. He's one of my heroes in, in colloidal silica research, as is Professor Shaw and Professor, Professor Wang. So thank you so much for coming. It is so great to be here in person. You can clap in person. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> colloidal silica or colloidal nanosilica is no longer an emerging technology. It has arrived. And we're gonna examine that a little bit today and I'm gonna explain what people are doing in the real world. The application of these nanomaterials, these novel nanomaterials that you've heard about at ACI for so many years. We're gonna dig into what's going on with the application of those materials in the real world. They're actually available and being used to extend the life cycle of concrete. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. So all of us in this room are working hard to help concrete last longer, but we're still not where we need to be as an industry. We're working very hard as you as that's why you're here. You guys made the trip to ACI because you're interested in what can make concrete better. And that's why I'm here today is to explain how the real world is catching up to the laboratory. We have a wonderful, wonderful process with new and novel materials that begins in your laboratories. And the giants on, on whose shoulders I'm standing on, some of them are here today. Some of the work that has been done has been instrumental in allowing industry to take these materials and use them for things like permeability reduction. Portland Cement Association, I love their definition of the relationship between permeability and durability. It's just simply, I'm not going to read it. You can read it simply that as permeability decreases, durability increases. The less permeable we can make our concrete, the more durable our concrete can be. Durability of concrete is the ultimate in the sustainability for me. Yes, I'm a big fan of using recycled materials. Yes, I'm a big fan of using locally sourced materials. However, if we can make structures that last 100 years, 150 years, instead of 30 40, 50 years. If we can build it once in that time frame, instead of having to rebuild it or continually repair these structures, to me, that's the gold crown when it comes to sustainability. Colloidal silica, most of you probably are aware and know what it is. In the industry, we call it colloidal silica rather than colloidal nanosilica because colloidal silica is hard enough to say as it is without inserting a nano. The colloidal assumes that you're talking about a nanoparticle uh, in the industry. It is silicon dioxide, an amorphous silicon dioxide particle on the nanoscale, less than 100 nanometers typically. Not every colloidal silica is identical. That's very, very important. When you're talking about nano-sized materials, a change in an average particle size of 10 nanometers can cause significant differences in the way the product performs. As Professor Hu pointed out, he had a 50 nanometer diameter particle and those don't always penetrate very well. So there are some tricks to the trade. There are some differences in colloidal silicas that are on the market. This tiny, tiny size is the most important part of a spray applied colloidal silica, what I like to call a post-placement pozzolan. That tiny size allows that particle to access most of the interconnected pore space in concrete when you have the right distribution package and the right delivery mechanism. This is uh, from a publication. I'd like to give Professor uh, Konstantin Sobolev credit for this, as well as others that worked on this. I'd like to give him a shout out, but I use this to demonstrate the other important aspect of the tiny size of colloidal silica, which is the surface area that's provided by that tiny size. So if you look up the y-axis, you'll see that the surface area of colloidal silica is greater than all of these normal concrete making materials. That surface area is important because that's the place where the reaction takes place. When we're talking about a pozzolanic reaction, or a, especially in a post-placement pozzolan type situation where you're spraying the product on the surface of the concrete, it's penetrating. That surface area is very, very important, as well as the ability to access those interconnected pore, pore space. 
Since 2000, more than 50 research teams spanning over 100 papers have published results demonstrating the improved properties of concretes containing colloidal silica. This is a mature technology now. ASTM currently has two working groups, one for spray applied, one for integral, that are working on specifications. And of course, as you know, ACI 241 provides extensive information on colloidal silica. It can be introduced as an additive at the time of mixing, and there are some advantages to doing that. It treats the entire load of concrete. However, spray applied colloidal silica or post-placement pozzolans, as I like to call them, can be applied or are applied after the voids have formed, after initial set, about the time you can walk on the concrete without leaving an impression is the perfect time to apply because the bleed water channels have formed. You then close the existing void structure with a pozzolanic reaction. Penetration depth is going to vary depending on whose colloidal silica you use, which formulation, if you will. But because it closes the capillary void structure at an early age, when used at time of placement, a colloidal silica can be used as a curing mechanism. What I mean by that is when you use compressive strength and drying shrinkage as your metrics for measuring curing effectiveness, colloidal silica can perform as well or better than moist curing for 28 days. Just a quick review, the products applied on the surface of the concrete where it penetrates into, the, the colloidal silica penetrates into the existing capillary structure, penetrating deeply. When I say deeply, I'm not talking about an eighth of an inch. I'm talking about deeply. When you have a distribution package that's figured out these tiny little particles, if, if you get them where they're not agglomerating and they can, they can really get in deep into the concrete where they can close that void structure. I'm thankful that video worked. I wasn't sure if it was or not, if it was going through or not. <clears throat> it can even be applied on, on uh, vertical or overhead surfaces if the formulation is correct and if you have that ionic attraction that's drawing it into the concrete. An example of some hydrostatic testing for waterproofing purposes. This is a old DIN 1048 test. It's, all, it's now the EN 12390-8 test. It's, not, it's a water penetration test under hydrostatic pressure. The test is performed for 72 hours at five bar, 72 and a half PSI. Um, this particular mix, this was done at Middle Tennessee State University years ago. This particular mix was a, I believe it was a 0.60 water cement ratio. We had specimens made out of the same wheelbarrow of concrete and we left some control specimens and treated some others with the spray applied colloidal silica. The test method tells you that if you have water exit the sides of the sample, that the test should be stopped and it's considered a failure. The control specimens failed at three hours. The treated specimen showed virtually no water penetration under five bar pressure at 72 hours in this 0.60 water cement ratio mix. So we're talking about closing void structures with an effective permanent. And what I mean by permanent is it's a common reaction product to concrete, calcium silicate hydrate, that becomes part of the structure. So that brings us to a real world project. That's what you're here for. <clears throat> I got a call from a bridge owner. This particular bridge owner had a durability concern with some relatively new concrete, six months or so. He asked me if I thought that the colloidal silica, spray applied colloidal silica could help with his durability. Now, compressive strengths were okay. The water had just gotten a bit out of whack and he was worried about durability of the, the concrete bridge deck. So we suggested that he use a uh, spray applied colloidal silica to close that void structure. And we offered up various ways for the evaluation to take place. So we can take a look at it. You know, we can take some cores. We can, before and after, we can do all of those things to help you figure out the effectiveness of the colloidal silica. And the bridge owner finally decided that no, they wanted to do surface resistivity and an improvement of 25% was considered to be a success. If we could improve surface resistivity readings by 25%, they were going to sign off and be fine. So what we did is a uh, 
independent laboratory was engaged. That's uh, TEC out of Atlanta, which uh, is an SGS company. They came up and did full point venter probe testing in 13 grid locations, five readings each location before the treatment was applied. Colloidal silica treatment was applied after those initial readings were obtained and then post-treatment readings were taken two weeks later in the exact same spot with the exact same moisture condition. Those are, moisture condition is very, very important when it comes to uh, four-point venoprobe readings. Lane one, we saw a 62% improvement in surface resistivity numbers. Lane two was a 31% improvement. The treatment met the bridge owner's expectations and that bridge is in service today and it would not have been otherwise. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. I know it was quick, but I wanted to whet your appetite to let you see that in the real world, colloidal silica is solving durability problems every single day. To my knowledge, over 500 million square feet, 50 million square meters of concrete has been treated with spray applied colloidal silica so far. Thank you so much.